Harold Davis. I'm here to teach you about the art and craft of digital photography. Good morning and welcome to the Harold Davis Studio in Berkeley, California. We are so excited to have you here today. Today's webinar is Finding the Mysterious in Photography. As nights grow longer and the days get shorter, and as we approach Halloween and All Saints Eve, the separation between our world and that of the spirit world gets thinner. Some of the very best photographs send a frisson of the spooky and the ineffable up our spines. How do they do this? And how do we incorporate that sense of being part of something beyond and bigger than ourselves into our own work? A more down-to-earth question might be, what techniques can be used to jumpstart creativity? And how do we move towards the mysterious and beyond the staid and commonplace in our own photography? In this webinar, Harold Davis will take a look at images that seem to invoke otherworldly qualities and examine how and why they do so. Often, these images can only be recognized in retrospect. Fortune favors the prepared mind, but in addition to planning, this kind of image making relies on recognizing serendipity and deploying a range of techniques, including free association, automatic creation, and the paradigms of the classical quest. How will you get ready for Halloween in this extraordinary year? Many of you know who Harold is, but if you're joining us for the first time today, here's a little bit about Harold. Harold Davis is the developer of a unique technique for photographing flowers for transparency, the creator of multi-raw processing and hand HDR processing. He is a Moab master and a Zeiss ambassador. Harold is an internationally known photographer and a sought after workshop leader. His website is digitalfieldguide.com. And now I'm going to hand it over to Harold. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to Finding the Mysterious in Photography. As Phyllis said, um, yes, mystery is important in photography because without mystery, what do we actually have? We don't have much. We have a straight photography of uh, buildings or something. So part of what makes one look twice at a photo is that there is something mysterious or to use a bigger word, ineffable about it. So I will try to take a look at that, but I'm also, we're also going to have some fun here and uh, because fun is important. And as Phyllis said also, uh, we're going to uh, look at some of the work that people sent in as well. I think that let's start off with some fun. So I want to introduce you to my good friend, um, Scully here. So Scully, it was a dark and stormy night. It was a dark and stormy night. It was a dark and stormy night. Alas, poor Yorick. Alas. No, try that again. Alas, poor York. Alas, poor York. Well, okay. You get the idea. Get the idea. Get the idea. Okay. Finding the mysterious in photography. Well, we have a number of sections here. First of all, a message from our sponsors, various books. There's nothing worse than a sharp image of a fuzzy concept. So mysterious, a lot of the times, are not going to be sharp images. I love this quote. Halloween. Okay. Well, here's, this is our fiber optic pumpkin. I got it, I think, at Costco many years ago to delight the kids. And it lasted for quite a while till we put it out in the rain one Halloween. Um, so it's fiber optics. This is a uh, Mexican uh, day, of, day of the Dead uh, sculpture that I photographed with a red light. Uh, one, of the, one of the kids in the back of the car, Nicholas, I think, Halloween costume. The, here's, a, here's another one. This one is perpetual blackmail material. Probably it's my uh, huge uh, high schooler, Matthew, as a, as a flying dragon, right, right Phyllis? 
Remember yes. this one? Yep, that's Matthew. Okay, and there they are. So, there's, yeah, I mean, okay. This is a little more recently. Uh, this is in the neighborhood. That's uh, Katie, who is on the right, and uh, the consequences of not wearing a mask on the left, going out and partying with the lay on and waving the mask around, but not wearing it. These are a sequence of photos from the Greenwich Village Halloween Parade that I photographed in the 1980s and early 90s in New York. Uh, Rephotographed off the, off the book that was done of the photos. Bite of the apple, a dangerous apple probably. Even the dogs came in costumes. Okay, ghosts. So, how do you photograph ghosts? Well, we saw we saw a uh, great uh, a great ghost in motion. Motion is a, a lot of the secret to creating ghost-like effect in photography. I, I called this one the ghosts of Grand Central Station because you see amid all the commuters ghosts going by about a four second exposure. This along the uh, Italian coast, the people getting in and out of the boat here became ghosts thanks to the long exposure. Ghosts in Paris down below, a double exposure with the background and the foreground, but the foreground motion is about 30 seconds of, of a pedestrian motion in the crowded alleys in, uh, in the Latin Quarter just off the Boulevard Saint Michel. Here's a more a ghost motorcycle in uh, Vietnam. And here with this one, the uh, ghost lights of the car came up. Uh, he got out, said, what are you doing here? I said, taking a photograph and he turned the lights off. So, and here are the ghosts of Alcatraz coming out of the cells down there. Actually, of course, other tourists, but and you have to look hard to make them out in this one, but uh, these are ghost horses moving around at night. This is uh, another ghosting technique really, which is uh, an L channel inversion of this model. And uh, in camera multiple exposure of a model here. I was just looking through some of these photos, preparing this a couple of days ago. And uh, so some of the multiple exposures of models like this, particularly this one combined in a photo composite with a background get very spooky. And here's a model juggling for me with an in-camera multiple exposure. I called this one ghost flowers. It's an L channel inversion of a light box image. So and maybe it's spooky. I don't know why I thought it was ghostly, but it's a, it's a much calmer, more beautiful kind of ghost. And the point of the long exposure in this image, I did a, a short exposure for the fountains, at, but the long exposure in the garden was actually take the moving people out because anybody moving during a long exposure vanishes if you, the exposure is long enough. So. There are uh, no ghosts in this enchanted garden. Phyllis, before I go on, are there any uh, questions? I don't see any questions. Constance was wondering about the uh, Halloween book. And um, I've just looked it up. Actually, I was going to put a link in the chat. It's available used on Amazon. Like people have copies of it. Oh my uh, gosh, we have of a it. guest. I have to share <gasps> my screen. Hold on a second here. Just hold on. We've got, we have a surprise guest. So where, what just happened? Uh, I become, or I just complete monster out in shed. Oh my gosh, is monster. Come inside so the camera can see you. Ah, oh. what is your name, monster? My name is not monster. I, I make monster. My name's Frankenstein. Stein. Stein. No, Frankenstein. Stein. Oh. <laughs> I come in for spook. I need image, spooky image to impression monsters so they can terrorize siblings. Okay. What kind of, so, uh, what kind? You want, well, you want, spooky image. Uh, you want, uh, ah, ah. Ah? 
You ah. skull? I turned skull on for you? Sure. Enable skull. Got it? I'll get it. No, I... Look at these sausages. Yeah. I cannot. Okay. Skull on. There we go. I be take skull. Ah. Maybe slightly creepy. Okay. Well, um, yeah, maybe more than slightly creepy. So uh, this is a photo composite of a skull inside a marble. And here's a clear photo composite of models with a skull with a marble up top reaching for something. I kind of like this one. Uh, this, ha, ah, this is Scully himself. There he is. I do like photographing skulls. Here's a, uh, it, this is, a, it's not necessarily an inversion here, but it's an L channel um, adjustment. And here's a skull in somebody's eye. This is a caribou skull from the Brooks Range from my trip there in the early 1980s. Here's a model made out to be an insect. These are a couple of images out of uh, our windows during the terrible air days we've had here in the thanks to the fires. So, so this is one of them, and here's another one. This was the day when uh, the uh, it, it, when the sky when the sky was red red and black all day, so not much fun. We have another uh, fire warning day coming up uh, starting Sunday night, so we'll have to see what happens. <laughs> For photography in a in a graveyard can also be kind of creepy. It's kind of hit him on the head with creepiness. Yeah, Connie, you're right. That sky is so. Uh, that sky is real, and it's so scary. More scary than anything one can make up. Statuary in uh, Palermo, Sicily. Yeah, he's pretty creepy. He's supposed to be creepy. I mean, sometimes creepy statuary is basically guarding things. This is a building in Prague in the Czech, uh, Czech Republic and modified again via uh, an LAB color adjustment and also with a crack, crack lure texture overlay. On the whole, I feel the succulent is benign, but having an eye in the center of something natural is a little weird, let's face it. So maybe slightly weird instead of creepy would be better here. A popover, an Icelandic poppy, popover nudicole. I just photographed uh, this up close in the Blasfeld effect mode. And uh, there is something about these buds that's a little almost skull-like. And this uh, butterfly is definitely a bit, a bit odd or creepy or something. I'm not, not sure, you know, it becomes a thing when you're photographing someone and the result is a little creepy, like with the multiple eyes here. Are you bringing out what's inside or is this an effect? And this is Nicholas who just was present with uh, half on one side in MRI and the other half is outside. This is the inside of a local mausoleum, the building with the mausoleum. And uh, I thought what made this creepy really was the normalcy of the image. This could be, if it, weren't, if it weren't what the subject matter is, this could be an architectural photo anywhere, basically, with a nice polished floor. Okay, things that look like something else. You let me know, Phyllis, if there are any questions and I'll be happy to try and answer them. So she looks like she's wearing a mask. Her face is her mask. And this is a single in camera, multiple exposure, nine times. Masks on a Japanese street in Tokyo. 
Um, a mask in Carnival in Venice. So a lot of masks here. I like masks for this purpose a little bit more than the other kind, but the other kind are necessary. This is a L channel inversion of a black mask, the model. And this becomes more complicated with a variety of LAB effects. Oh, I see a uh, Blossfeld method, B-L-O-S-S-F-E-L-D-T, Carl with a K, Carl Blossfeld, um, a great botanical artist and died in about 1930 and uh, worth and you'll, you'd enjoy his work very much. I see Phyllis just posted a link. This section in creative black and white on how to simulate uh, his, his look using, um, you know, modern software. This is um, our almost grown daughter now, Katie, with a mask back a few years ago. Things that look like other things. This is a plumbing fixture. This is a uh, church in a bottle, superimposed a photo composite into a bottle. This is looking down a uh, a glass cup, I guess, with a with a lens on top. So it's kind of a fractal like spiral down into a glass cup. This is a sunlight in on the side of a glass jar, and this is a. Part, part of the technique that I'm, that I'm showing on uh, Thursday is uh, photographing sunlight coming through liquid and glass. And this is, this is a mandala or a rusty fan, depending on how you want to look at things. The inside of a fuchsia, a flower blossom burning bright. A landscape painted onto a Venetian blind. The the inspiration here is really the surrealist painter, René Magritte. A, trans, a, mug, a, 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 a transformation of a paper clip into a flower, really uh, straightforward. Looking down into a blown glass bowl, looks like a puddle like that. This is, uh, inside a carafe, a glass carafe of cut glass. And so what I have is I have a probe lens on a stick that goes down through the neck of the bottle. And so this is the inside of the bottle. Bottle is placed on a backlit light table. This is the same lens down into a, a bowl, a patterned bowl. So the lens is basically pretty wide angle and it spreads out the uh, bowl. And this is looking down into a cut glass, parfait glass. I include this sliced apple one because it looks very almost um, anodyne as an image. But if you look at the apple that's on the left, um, you know, it's funny, I have to uh, uh, take my right hand to show you your left. I'm backwards, I think. But anyhow, you'll, you'll see it's a little face with almost a little goatee beard and mischievous eyes. So there's some anthropomorphization going on inside this image. And yes, that's intentional. And this is a photo con composite of a model turned into a fish with my eye on it. The new antique. This this is um, a bench in the decrepit waiting room of the old Oakland train station, the terminus, the western terminus of the Union Pacific Railway, which did its last train about uh, about eighty years ago. Another inside of a crystal, another parfait glass. This is an L channel inversion of glasses on a light box of various kinds. So you see the, the parfait glass in the back is the 
one that I showed you earlier. The carafe on the left is the one that had the probe lens down it. This is a simulation of one of my model multiple exposures on a simulated tintype background. So it is apparently an antique photo with movement. And here's another simulated uh, tintype background. And uh, this one too. Oh, this is a little, a little more audacious perhaps because the model here is coming out of the background, as you can see on the uh, on the on the left hand side with the hand. And here's a simulated old look for this for the garden in Valandre in the Loire Valley in France, a very classical French garden with these geometric shapes. It's also a uh, one of the uh, images in creative garden photography. Wabi-sabi, a Japanese concept meaning beauty and decay, the full life cycle of things, particularly in nature, as they get older. This is a dried uh, popover sum, uh, somnifera pod. So this is an opium poppy that's dried and photographed from above, again with the Carl Blossfeld effect. Lavender uh, pods dried, more dried, a dried twig. Uh, scabiosa is, is what these uh, decorative pods are called. And again, they've dried, so it's kind of gone to seed. Here, this tulip is colorful tulip, but it's long past its prime. I would say it's beautiful anyhow. And here's a composition with the uh, tulips in a vase on uh, a textured background. Where do you draw the line? How do you figure out how to make a composition with petals that are like this, that are dried and in seed and with this uh, tulip here that is still very beautiful, but kind of the skeleton or shadow of what it was. And uh, anemones that are also long past their prime here. This I did uh, oh, a month or so ago on a light box and it's all the flowers that are component parts, All they're all from, from our garden these dahlias and the fuchsias and so on. And they're all in a wabi-sabi situation. They're dried and uh, long past their prime. And here's another elaborate composition with a butterfly, no less, showing uh, flowers that should not seem to be beautiful anymore. Autumn. Well, autumn is, of course, at the end of autumn, you get renewal. The trees are bare and then and then you're going to have winter coming, and it's in some and and here in the Bay Area on the Pacific, we really don't have autumn in quite the same way. See, the most you get on the uh, eastern slope of the Sierras are trees changing like about this, and uh, you know and. Sometimes I, I, I long for going back to the Northeast and the beautiful colors of the autumn in places where there are more deciduous trees, but these are nice in their own way. And if you do a lot of traveling around wilderness areas like this one in the back country in Zion in the winter, you see autumnal trees like that looking up Yosemite in uh, autumn. Owens Valley, the Eastern Sierra. No, no, that's not the Eastern Sierra. I think this arcade was in the autumn in Portugal. And then when I've been photographing collections of my, my sort of thing, my things, I've, lately I've been doing autumn colors, like the sunflowers and the galeria in the center here. And truly this photographed recently is a very, autumnal image it's um and that that's really the idea here with the sunflowers and the wabi-sabi flowers in, in autumnal colors on this kind of background the background being a uh baking sheet with a texture overlay shadows there's a reason we're we 
perhaps fear shadows and they are um, a signifier of the other world and of things coming in. This, uh, this is the waiting room of the old Union Pacific train station in Oakland. I showed the bench from this waiting room. You can see it in the deep background of this image, but there's also the light cast in from the door here and the darkness of these vast unused halls. This light tree coming out of the shadows, it's got snow and ice on it, very unusual for around here. Shadows in a cave with the two human figures in it. Yeah, this one's kind of tricky. I mean, would the shadow of this squash actually have a hole for the eye? I don't think so. Simple composition here with the lines of the fence going down, the lines are the shadows. I've been looking through my uh, photography from Eureka Dunes, which is a sort of out, uh, out holding in Death Valley. It's not connected to the rest of the park and it's relatively hard to get to. And it's the most incredible dunes at the end of a, end of a long valley where the sand co collects in a sand trap and it's kind of a naturally plays music. There's almost always a musical note coming out of these dunes because there's almost always wind. But if you look at this image, there are sh the shadows of the lines of the wind and the dunes and also the streak of sunlight across the end of it. Now here's another dune shadow photo for, from Death Valley. And one side of the dunes here is in shadow and the other is not. In Santiago de Compostela at the um, old, the, the old uh, Parador there was originally one of the world's first hospitals set up by the uh, kings and queens of Spain and in the cha in the room above the chapel, which is where this was, where the stained glass from the chapel cast these shadows on, on the wall, there was a room for people who were dying. So that's what this room was with this beautiful light on the wall where they could listen to the music. This is a shadow cast by Mount Diablo here in the Bay Area looking east to the Sierra out over the somewhat um, air not being so clear valley. But what's interesting is the triangular shape that the uh, shadow of the mountain casts. You once in the sunlight here and casting a shadow as the sun goes into the west. This is a um, crepuscular shadow, uh, so called as the uh, shadow comes off the tower of the Golden Gate Bridge onto the clouds that are surrounding the bridge. This image and the next one, uh, what I did was I photographed a marble on a piece of white paper. I used a strong light to cast a shadow from the marble and into the, into the shadow I put another image, in this case uh, a seascape and in this case a sunset. And here's a simple technique, a generated shadow. Ah, uh, this is the selfie shadow. I'm trying to look like the tree here, but it's actually just me. And shadows coming through a, uh, a barn door. Shadows of one building on another building, kind of creepy building in shadow land here. window and shadow. So a simple image. I think a very pandemic image, one's inside looking out and uh, very simple image to make, simple image to see, but some visual complexity here. Serendipity. Well, I think uh, serendipity means taking advantage of chance really in photography and chance is always going to play a role in almost every thing we create. The idea is to know it when you see it and to use it and take advantage of it. So 
I do like to say that fortune favors the prepared mind. If you close yourself off to the possibility of using serendipity, it's going to be a problem. But on the other hand, once something comes up, you want to know what to do with it. So here's a prismatic effect on a waterfall. You can see here. Here's the bigger waterfall out there, Upper White River Falls in Eastern Oregon. This is the Klamath Bar in, in early sunrise. Looking out over the Sierra Crest, looking, looking uh, west from the Sierra Crest. This is sunset with the uh, Mesa in some degree of snow from in the Canyonlands area. Is a risky point, Death Valley at uh, sunrise. These succulents here were uh, growing around the corner and the light wasn't really great, but I was walking by. So I stopped with my camera tripod, took a photo. And I said, well, I'm gonna come back. Uh, I'm gonna come back in, in the uh, late golden hour when the light's gonna be better, not quite so harsh. By the time I came back, they were all dried up and gone. So part of serendipity is to seize the day, carpe diem. If you see it and you can photograph it, don't wait because nothing ever stays the same. Canyon lands. This is Lake Isabel. I was just driving past. I saw this. I stopped. I took the photo. And... Uh, a misty morning. Old bristlecone pine up in the pine woods. Very much a serendipitous, like, okay, look around. There are these rays of light coming down the coast. Let's do a photograph. And here the skim ice was reminds me of the stars in the sky on the ice. evening light on the hills. This is the sun sunset in the harbor of uh, uh, Zelendi on the island of uh, Gozo, part of the Malta uh, archipelago in the Mediterranean and uh, beautiful sunset. And light in a glass bottle mountains again in that case this is this has been fun a special shout out to nicholas if he ever watches this for an, a guest appearance as dr frankenstein he took the skull away you know that otherwise i'd have the skull to join us again too <laughs> bye everyone <laughs>